Nintendo Wii U has just been released. Hashtag PlayStation 2013 is trending, and the dev kits for Microsoft's new console are making waves with developers. The next generation of consoles is almost here. This is a key part of the generational cycle where we, as potential customers, are bombarded with complicated specs, weird tech demos, and IP hoarding. So what I'd like to show you is my new edition. Sometimes these launches are successful, whereas other times they can actually cause significant harm to the ongoing sales of a new console. Today we're going to have a look at some past console launches, both good and bad. After breaking down each one and working out their strengths and weaknesses, we're going to move on and have a look at the next generation of consoles, and try and work out what exactly their campaign managers should be focusing on. We'll begin with one of the best consoles of all time, the SNES. Although this console is rightly regarded as a classic, its initial release was not a sure thing by any stretch of the imagination. Nintendo had dominated the 8-bit marketplace with the original NES, but Sega had beaten them to the 16-bit market by a huge amount of time, having released the Mega Drive in Japan a full two years before Nintendo released the SNES. In addition to this, there was a very staggered launch throughout the world. The SNES was released in Japan in 1990 and America in 1991, whereas major markets such as Europe didn't even get their hands on the console till 1992. Despite all this, Nintendo still managed to gain a strong foothold in the market, eventually outselling the Mega Drive worldwide. There wasn't really internet as we know it at the time, so the majority of their marketing was done through television spots and enthusiast magazines. Nintendo was fortunate that their name was so highly regarded following the success of the NES, as it led many customers to simply ride out the wait for the new console. It also had the benefit of having strong titles at and close to the launch of the console, such as F-Zero, Pilot Wings, and the first console port of Street Fighter II. These games showed off the technical features of the SNES, such as the expanded color palette and Mode 7. The console also used Super Mario World as a packing game for years, encouraging people to buy the console even if they couldn't afford to build a game library straight away. We can see that Nintendo knew that their brand was trusted enough to take their time with the launch of the SNES, and it paid off for them in spades. In comparison, Sega's launch of the Saturn was a disaster, particularly in North America. At the time, Sega fans had lost a lot of faith in the company in the wake of the Sega CD and 32X. Sega was eager to try and recreate the success they had found with their 16-bit offering, the Mega Drive. The upcoming launch of the Sony PlayStation seemed to spook them though, and there were several problems with the Saturn's launch. The first was the confusion regarding the American release date. For months, Sega had been promoting Saturn Day, September 2nd, 1995, as the official launch date for the console. However, at their E3 showing on May 11th, Sega announced that the console was actually available in stores that day. This was supposed to give Sega a surprise four-month head start on Sony, but both developers and consumers were not ready for the new console yet. There were only six games available at launch, since many developers had been planning their games for the original September launch date. The launch games themselves were also significantly less impressive than they should have been due to the shortened development and the complex nature of the dual CPU Saturn hardware. Finally, the console was also extremely expensive. 399 US dollars, a full hundred dollars more than the PlayStation. With this in mind, it's no surprise that Sega had problems in the 32-bit generation that ended up eventually sinking the company's console ambitions. A more recent and more infamous launch was the PlayStation 3 in late 2006. Of all the consoles we've looked at today, this is the only one where information spread through the internet was a major factor in the console's struggles. Considering the popularity of the PlayStation 2, this system should have been a no-brainer. Sony had promised that all the information about their next machine would be at the E3 conference earlier that year. With the popularity of online video and YouTube, this conference was watched by fans both live and later on demand. As such, the lackluster games and embarrassing promotional material shown put people off the new system in favour of the Xbox 360, which was already available and had a large selection of games. 
What I love about the PlayStation is the feel of the controller in my hands. I like the, the hard plastic and the little knobby bits. The final nail in the coffin for both the console and the launch itself was the price. 599 US dollars. This number floated around the internet for months and essentially poisoned the launch of the PlayStation 3. The terrible arty ad campaigns did not help matters. <laughs> Whilst the console eventually managed to drag itself out of the hole Sony had dug during its launch, it only did so through extreme financial investments that should not have been needed in the first place. So having thought about these launches, there's a couple of things that jump out at you initially. Now obviously price is a factor. Now, no one expects consoles to be cheap at first, but there has to be some sort of sense of value for money. This can be achieved in a lot of ways, but a pack-in title is a really good idea. It's kind of like how the Super Nintendo was buoyed by Super Mario World. Companies also have to be very clear about their target audiences, and try not to spread themselves too thin. E3 is notorious for companies that feel the need to bamboozle the audience with celebrities and fancy effects, whereas what customers really want to see are the games. Companies have to remember that consoles have long lifespans, but limited early stock, so their popularity is going to be determined a lot by the word of mouth generated by early adopters. With online video becoming exponentially more popular, and conferences now being streamed live to consumers, it's more important than ever to show these customers in particular what they want to see. The environment that these consoles are being launched in is obviously totally different to the ones that we've looked at during this episode, but these key areas are still very important. This is one of the most exciting times in the generational cycle. I can't wait to see what everyone comes up with.